Nothing's better than fresh fruit from the garden. I just can't say that enough. This particular plant will actually shoot up additional leaf tissue. The program was to create food for the public. They are public orchards. It's a lot of work, but it really is worth it when you see all these blooms and it's gorgeous. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Ashley Smith, Director of Content here at WDSE WRPT and your host for this evening. We have with us our garden experts tonight. They are horticulturalist and educator Bob Olin and garden professional Deb Ber Burns Erickson. Thank you both so much for being here tonight. It's a pleasure always. Great. And as always, we want to hear from gardeners across the region who have questions for our experts on all things gardening. Volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners Program are here to answer the phones. So call locally at 218-788-2844 or email us at ask at wdse.org. Now, let's talk current conditions. Oh my gosh, it's beautiful, beautiful. outside. It's summer. <laughs> it is summer. It is perfect. We waited long enough, yes, but yes. I think it's been magnificent. We've had it some is. nice moisture and things are greening up. They're and budding out. And budding out and blooming and... Oh, the landscapes with so many of the lilacs are out oh, now and all of yes, the, uh, and the flowering crabs. Flowering and crabs are gorgeous. Plums. And yeah. yeah. And Tell you what, it's been painful, I think, for me getting through the winter. So I'm, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this beautiful weather. It is beautiful. <laughs> In 2020, we showed you the building of the Superior Community Gardens, a project that began in 2019. Tonight, we return to the gardens to learn how their plots have been developing. Ruth Ludwig, I am one of the founders of Superior Community Gardens Association and I am currently a board member and treasurer of the association. We are at our Oaks Avenue Community Garden on the 2300 block of Oaks Avenue. The Master Gardeners, uh, several years ago, there were a group of us that were sitting around the table thinking we have people out in the community that have been, have been asking us if there's a, a garden where people can you know come in you know and garden if they don't have room in their yard and so we thought well we should build a, a community garden for people to rent plots here in Superior and so the city did approve a five-year um, rental agreement with us June of 2019 then we built the fence and started um, building on the community garden things that I have seen grown here, tomatoes, peas, beans, you know, pumpkins, squash, Brussels sprouts, I've seen Brussels sprouts, which I've never grown before. You know, and that's part of the fun of a community garden too, is seeing different plants that people grow that maybe you've never thought of trying. And it's like, oh, I really like this. I think I'm gonna try this next year. We have garden rules and as long as they abide by the gardening rules, um, you know, they can grow what they want. We do have rules as far as trying to keep it as organic as possible. No herbicides, no pesticides. We would prefer, you know, organic fertilizer. Um, we provide compost. It is late, you know, if you look around the garden here, yeah, you can see that the majority of our beds um, have not even been planted yet. You know, there's still time. Hopefully Mother Nature will uh, cooperate for us. There's still time to grow yet. We still have some garden plots available for rent. Some of our perimeter gardens are still available for rent. You know, I always say that gardening to me is therapy, a place to, I, I guess, commune with nature. I've been very happy with what this garden has, has achieved so far. We continue to grow and bring consciousness of the value of gardening um, to the community. I look forward to continuing on uh, growing this garden and expanding into other neighborhoods within the city. It was great to see the update on those garden plots, don't you think? Yeah, I think they're being <laughs> congratulated. It's wonderful to have a facility like that, and there are community gardens throughout communities in the region, and it, she mentioned that it does really bring people together, yeah. and it's therapeutic, particularly after that long, mm -hmm. rather cold mm -hmm. winter week. Right, mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely. So, Bob, you wanted to talk to us about the seasonal outlook. Yeah, this is kind of fun. Now, we came through a very, very cold early May, and actually that was in the forecast. We were going to have at least average conditions, but, uh, and this information comes from uh, NOAA and their Climate Prediction Center, and they're pretty good long range. And this is what they're seeing is coming up, and things have definitely warmed up, but warmer than normal. 
and then as far as precipitation goes, a little bit below normal. And it's that combination, that's what we experienced last year uh, during the growing season. And it may be that that's what we're going to have again. We'll just have to wait and see. Obviously, climate and weather can be variable, but uh, pretty good bet we're going to have some warm conditions. So we want to focus, I think, on some of our warm season crops. We did quite a bit of work with roasting peppers. A lot of interest there that carry quite a premium price in the grocery store. So consequently, uh, people are growing their own. Found some good varieties, tomatoes, obviously, but I think in addition, some of the vine crops. I think we'll be looking at melons, and sweet potatoes, and as things maybe warm up a little bit, this opens up a number of new varieties for us here in the Northland. Mm -hmm. I think people had success last year with them. That's what we're seeing. Yeah, a they lot did, of success really. with the warm, because it was warm and dry last year. So if it worked for you last year, it's possible it's going to do well for you again. Possible is the word. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Perfect. Well, let's talk crab apples. Yeah, we talked about the landscapes, and right now they're just so beautiful. And if you just take a little look around, um, we've got several varieties that are just magnificent in the landscape right now. The flowering crabs are nice because, of course, they're beautiful with the spring bloom. Uh, they're a great source of pollen for pollinating insects. There's so much interest right now in, in providing habitat for pollinators, and certainly the flowering crabs do that. Many of them are very, very hardy and long-lived, so you've got to be a little careful with your variety selection, and we'll point out a couple of those for folks. But um, most of them, and I get this question often, will they pollinate my edible apples? And they will if the bloom is approximately at about Tiny. the same time. So your early producing apples, a state fair or, or perhaps a prairie magic that come in very early, they're definitely being pollinated from the pollen of uh, flowering crabs. And then... Um, you know, obviously some of the fruit is very excellent. It's edible, uh, whether it be for humans or for birds. The birds love them, and a lot of the, f the fruit is actually retained, so there's winter interest uh, later in the season. Some of the foliage can be very nice as well. So there are a lot of good reasons to take a look at uh, flowering crabs in the landscape. I wanted to point out a couple. These are throughout our landscapes. Uh, this is radiant. These are the oldies but the goodies. And as I get a little older, I begin to appreciate that expression more and more. <laughs> but these were actually introduced in the 40s and the 50s. Radiant crab here, and they're throughout our landscape. It's that deep red color, very hardy. These are 40, 50 years old. They were uh, introduced in the 40s, actually, University of Minnesota introduction in the landscape. And then we've got red splendor. This is the one that's a little pinker, comes a little earlier. That was actually an introduction from... Uh, Saskatchewan, so it's a Canadian introduction, again, very, very hardy, zone three, and um, has some disease resistance as well, so that's another beautiful component. And then we've got a white that's very, very attractive, one that I, I just love. This is snowdrift, and you can see the pollinators just shot this photo a day or so ago. The pollinators are very, very active, and again, a very, very hardy variety, and that was another Canadian introduction. They look so nice uh, next to each other, uh, these compositions in the landscape, and uh, these are very, very winter hardy. So those radiant red splendor and uh, snowdrift are three suggestions. Old varieties, but they will be here in another 30, 40 years. So a lot of newer varieties are looking for color and they're looking for disease resistance, but you have to be just a little bit careful because uh, they're not necessarily hardy for our zone three areas. Like the old ones, yeah. Yeah, there's beautiful blooms. They're my favorite ones to see, I think, and even driving around the area, you can see people snapping photos. Yeah. You, know? you, have a, you have a beautiful radiant crab just outside the door here at the yeah. studio. And Deb, you've got a favorite royalty, royalty. which yep. has initially darker foliage. Darker foliage that's mm -hmm. very attractive as mm -hmm. well. And that's a hardy variety too. So mm -hmm. look for the hardy variety, zone three, start there in your landscape. And then you can add an experiment with some mm -hmm. of the newer intro mm -hmm. introductions. Help right. the pollinators out. Right. Thank you. Well, we can get to some of our viewer questions now. We've been having some pour in on email and via phone, but if you haven't uh, had a chance to call in with your question yet, you can call or send an email to ask at wdse.org. So let's jump right into these, shall we? All right, Donnie would like to know, how do seeds know to grow up? Oh. <laughs> that's a good question. That's a cute <laughs> question. That's a good question. Yeah. It's, it's, actually, mm -hmm. well, it's related to gravity and the geotropism, they call it. So they're actually uh, working with an inbred mechanism into the seed. And you have a root radical that knows to down. go down. And you've got a, uh, uh, the top stock that grows up, of course. And that's, that's the actually physiology of the seed. Mm -hmm. It's uh, genetically programmed that way. Wow. 
That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so let's see. We have another question here. I have a rhubarb plant that's being stripped of the new growth leaves. The veins are left, but lack of leaves are stressing the plant. Thoughts? Well, that would definitely stress the plants. Mm -hmm. No, it depends. Rhubarb is pretty resilient to a lot of... Uh, insect pressure? Yeah, that, that could be insect pressure. You can kind of tell if it's got a jagged edge. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's been taken down, that deer will actually take rhubarb early, very early in the season. There's an oxalic acid that builds up over time, and then they don't want to touch it. But uh, very early, so that might be a possibility. But I would look for some insect activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got a few uh, pests that can attack early, particularly with the warm weather, and I think that's mm -hmm. probably what's occurring there. Mm -hmm. Hit it with some warm, I mean some soap and water and really hit it hard if it is some oh. small pest versus yeah, your you deer. You can start there. <laughs> the other thing, very early, if they do strip it down, you just pull the stock out and they will regrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very early in the season, so you, you, you won't, uh, you can get some regrowth from those rhubarb plants. Great. But if the leaves are pretty much gone, I'd probably just take them off and let the plant regenerate right, some new stems. because it won't heal it, and then it right. will try to focus its energy on healing rather than on producing new stocks. Right. right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sam from Washburn would like to know, back to the warm weather coming in here, <laughs> what's the latest date that you could plant carrot seeds? Ooh, that's oh, that's a good question. Well, you can... They'll germinate, uh, you know, the, the longer you have them in, of course, the larger the, the root. But I think you could probably start those even in early July for a fall crop. The mm -hmm. roots aren't going to be quite as uh, large, but uh, you can start those mid-season if you, if you need to. But uh, again, as, as take some of your early maturing and s smaller varieties mm -hmm. for if you are going to plant And late. watch for the moisture. If it's going to get <laughs> drier, then it's going to be harder to germinate. And so yeah. they might want to do them sooner than later because if we're going to have a drier summer, because it was a problem last year with germination because it was so dry and... Germination and anything, you're in about a, a quarter of an inch, you're planting depth and that can dry down very really quickly, quickly, so that's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Have, the, have your uh, watering system ready and hit it every morning, just make sure that seed bed stays moist. Right. Well, speaking of growing edible, edible plants, for someone who has not done that before, what is the benefit of growing your own food? Is it more so nutritional? Many. Is it yeah. more control? You have yeah. just so much more control of your input and your output and what you're going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And you can control the variety selection. There is so much more control to doing it yourself. Right. Very and, true. and much better ta taste yes. and um, a lot better uh, for yourself and for your family. Absolutely. You know, it was always economics. Then the economics went away and it became mm -hmm. food quality. It mm -hmm. became. Uh, food security because yes. you know what you have just exactly what you pointed mm -hmm, out in mm -hmm, terms of control mm -hmm. there But I think maybe economics might be coming back into play again right. this year mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> because you get a high quality you stay away from all your pesticides and then basically it's equivalent of organic And they can carry a pretty high price at, uh, at outlets. That's yes. very true. Unfortunately mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, We'll switch gears here Serene from Little Murray would like to know can she use wood chips from spruce balsam trees on her garden? Vegetable garden, right? Yeah. That's where, yeah. All wood chips, you know, they're, right. they're high in carbon. So as a mulch on the soil surface, they're going to be fine. But they do tend to pull s nitrogen out of the soil as they decompose. So she may have to add a little additional nitrogen. The thing about balsam that we're a little concerned about, if she has a lot of balsam, is not so much the chips, but they do carry the fungi with, that's responsible for witch's broom on our blueberries, which can be a very destructive pest. So I'm not real fond of balsam. I'm in the process of removing a few balsam for that reason, the co-host for the witch's broom. But the chips are gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Keep speaking some of witch's broom, we actually got a question about oh, really? witch's broom. <laughs> 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 Any new strategies for dealing with witch's broom in blueberries? We prune it out every year, but it keeps coming back. We've cut out all of the balsam trees around the patch. Bob. Boy, now, that, now we got right this. Alley. Isn't that, isn't <laughs> it that is. interesting? <laughs> it is. This is live television. We didn't know that question was coming. <laughs> But uh, witch's broom, it does have this characteristic uh, formation out there. It, it is systemic. In other words, the fungi spends part of its life on uh, the balsam tree and part of its life on your blueberry plant in this case. And then it gets through the system. That's why it keeps reappearing. Other than removing as much balsam as you can, I don't have a good solution. We don't have good fungicides that I'm aware of. 
-hmm. And uh, I would say uh, I would be pruning out older stems, prune out all the witches broom and any older stem they need to be renovated so we want to get the newer young material and then you just kind of have to manage it. I'm afraid that she might uh, or he might want to have some new plants ready to go so if they really are in decline uh, then I would probably be introducing some new plants at some point. And if people don't know what witch's broom is, it looks like a witch's broom. It's just really oh. distorted um, stems and mm -hmm. it looks just like a lot of little... Right. I wish I had a better response because <laughs> I've struggled with it as well. Just keep pruning and yeah. ultimately if you do have to take the patch out and start over you may have to. Right. Uh, but getting rid of the balsam is, is one solution. She's done that already. Right. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Grim outlook there. <laughs> um, Robin from Proctor has asked, what is the best grass to grow on my deck in my real planter that's 10 inches deep? Best grass? The best grass. Looking for an ornamental, maybe? maybe? Most of us are growing grass out in the, in the lawn. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so I would guess it's not going to be something really large, mm -hmm. and it's a 10 inch deep, and um, some of the smaller ponytails, um, ornamentals. A rubrum gets quite large, and so that would take up most of the moisture and would get really large in a um, uh, planter box, especially when it's only 10 inches. And it's not a rail planter, it's just a planter that's on the deck, mm -hmm. correct? Um, if, she could, if they could do a bigger container, they can do a bigger grass. Right. Um, but grass can also tolerate being drier and they're more drought resistant, so that would be okay. But if you mix it with other things, that's where you're going to have more failure. But um, I mean, you could look at other things like a, a spider plant or things that resemble a grass that are not quite as large. But, and there are a few of uh, the ornamentals, um, but I, I would go for a bigger container if you really want right. to grow some ornamentals. Mm -hmm. Or just open up the possibility to time or to uh, uh, some of the clovers, which are, are big for pollinating right now, and uh, maybe consider a combination that the l some of the lower stature other materials. Great, thank you. Well, we have a request for help here that I think we need to address, which is from Cindy. She says, I have three endless summer hydrangeas that are about six years old. <laughs> they had a few blooms the first two years in blue. Now they have beautiful foliage and no blooms. I tried using Boom Bloom with no luck. They're facing south southeast with a little midday shade in front of a brick home with sandy soil. Any suggestions? Help. <laughs> yeah. I have one suggestion. I had a customer that had the same question and it's old wood that they're blooming off of and it dies down to the crown and they ended up digging them up and bringing them to their daughter-in-law <laughs> down in Farmington because it just old wood, not hardy mm. and dying back down to the crown. Now it's, it is really interesting because the endless summer that's become a whole series for one of our major wholesalers but the original that the name came from mm -hmm. uh, it's been affectionately called endless bummer because of this difficulty getting it into bloom. Yeah. One thing that I've observed, and she's acidic there because it will bloom, uh, it'll bloom lavender or, or blue on an acid soil or it will bloom pink or alkaline on, on an alkaline soil. It's possible with the brick foundation that there's some problem there. It also have, may have too much vigor. Mm -hmm. I've seen where if you cut it back a little bit, a little bit of a poorer site. It sounds like she's got great vegetative growth, but mm -hmm. no bloom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No fertility. Uh, uh, treated a little bit more poorly, and uh, sometimes that's what triggers the right. bloom. More well, potassium, yeah. more phosphorus as well, and less nitrogen. Great. Well, good luck to you, Cindy. <laughs> and we'll be back with more great gardening shortly. But first, let's take a look at your sent in photos. Here's the local dirt. Let's see what's growing in your neighborhood with the local dirt. Mike Heim of Hayward, Wisconsin, sent us an image of a hibiscus. He says this one is native to Minnesota, and as such a lovely pink bloom, we're sure glad to call it home. Next, Mickey McGilligan showed us an orange nasturtium with a bright, brilliant color that lights up any garden. From the garden of Don and Nancy Larson, we spot a sprout of sublime cone flowers. And a hydrangea. Don and Nancy also grew a beautiful purple clematis. And to top it off, a ravishing red chatters double hollyhock. 
Finally, Charles Carlson sent us a pair of videos from his gardens from last year. Take a look. Send us photos from your garden. Email us at greatgardening at wdse.org and it could show up on air or on our Instagram feed. Welcome back to Great Gardening. In a moment, Deb will talk to us about container gardens, but first, let's get some more questions. All right, Doreen would like to know, what kind of soil do sweet potatoes grow best in? Oh, that's Ooh. a good question. Go now that we're gonna become uh, sweet potato grow growers in a warming <laughs> climate, <laughs> uh, I would I really change. say that uh, just a well-drained soil, that's gonna be important. They don't like their feet wet. Uh, they do not like it cool at all. So if you, you, you know, this is different than an Irish potato. You're gonna be getting living plant material. You're going, going to be getting what we call slips that'll come from uh, farms a little farther south. You never want to refrigerate those. Just put them in water and wait until we're, uh, we've got temperatures that are consistently above 40 or 50 degrees. Then in the soil, you plant them. Uh, a nice mix, maybe a little bit of organic material in there, but drainage is going to be the key. Drainage, full sun, and then delaying your planting until we get consistently warm temperatures, like about the third week in June. Okay, great, sounds good. And there's a question here from Diane that I didn't know I needed to know until I read it, which is, <laughs> what is the difference between garden soil and topsoil? Ooh, big difference between garden <laughs> soil and topsoil. Um, oh, go ahead. Well, did, garden did. soil is um, amended. It has um, good nutrition. It's real soil. Um, some of it has compost amended into it. Um, it's lighter. If you pick up a bag of garden soil compared to topsoil, topsoil is extremely heavy. Mm -hmm. It is really dense. Mm -hmm. Where garden soil is nice, it's light, it's um, easy to work with, um, easy for the roots and for the plant to thrive in. Yeah. And the topsoil is not. <laughs> um, it's, it's dense. It's yeah, topsoil. I think they're referring to what's in the backyard there. Uh, you know, the upper six or eight inches of the soil profile. This is mineral soil. Mm -hmm. It all came from rock that were broke down over time, and there is an organic fraction in that, so it's a little richer. You get down into subsoils, but garden soil, as you point out, it's going to be lighter. In many cases, particularly container soils, it'll come from an organic source, a peat source. And then actually mixing a little bit of the two is not a bad idea. Yeah. But I think her question's about uh, topsoil, and that is the mineral soil component. We'd like to mix the two maybe and get a good quality, friable, open mm -hmm. garden soil. Mm -hmm. Yes, perfect. Well, Deanne would like to know, Calliope geranium, is that pronounced correctly there? Calliope. <laughs> Oh God, good thing I asked That's you to okay. say it. <laughs> Versus tango geranium, which will give me the best full summer bloom and habit. Oh, well they're completely different. Um, Calliope geranium is an intersectional geranium that is a cross between the zonal upright geranium, which just goes straight up, um, but it's, it's crossed with more of the ivy geranium genetics. So you get a full round ball and you get really large blossoms on the um, calliope. Tango is a tighter, I mean it's nice and it's tidy. Um, and it has dark foliage and the flowers are not quite as large as the calliope. Calliope is great for containers. Um, uh, tango is a little bit nicer for things that are small and contained and you don't want it to get too big. A calliope uh, geranium can get huge and mm. they are spectacular. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. Mary from Gilbert has asked, what can I use to remove weeds, not round up? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, when she says remove weeds, uh, annuals and perennials, the annual weeds all come from seed and that's shallow cultivation is going to be your best choice. Uh, if she's talking about a perennial weed like quackgrass, you're going to really have to cover and I think something where the light can't penetrate, that's one technique they can use. Plenty of mulch or you're just going to have to get there and not only dig out the upper portion of the plant, but most perennials got root systems and underground stem systems that all has to come out so you can hand dig. But I think cultivation is going to be the answer in, in many cases and you can, she can stay away from Roundup and all the other 
potential herbicides. And if it is a, a weed seed, keeping them from, I mean, it, I, sometimes I get lazy and I don't want to pull and things are getting away from me. If you can get a weed that propagates by seed and you can at least um, weed whip it or, you know, g get in there and cut it back before it goes to bloom, you are going to, there's going to be so much less seed that you're going to have to deal with. And I know it's lazy. I know it. But <laughs> it, it will take care of a lot of the weed seed and get it before it can get into weeds. So is weeding part of the mental health aspect of gardening? <laughs> <laughs> it should be. Can we convince yes. ourselves Let's of that? that. <laughs> yes, yes. There yes. you go. Mental therapy <laughs> cheap. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Mike from Maple, Wisconsin is an experienced composter. Great. What should he be doing to the piles in the spring? Ooh, it depends so on how old the pile is. Right, and depends on how far along it is. Uh, in the spring, usually what happens in an outside pile is you dry down. And even if you've got your carbon and nitrogen right, it's dry on the outside, so that stopped the process. So at a bare minimum, he wants to take those materials that were not composted and work them into the interior of the pile and get things started again. That usually does require, unless you've had a lot of rain, but now that it's drier, uh, have the hose there. So let's get some moisture there, maybe supply a little additional nitrogen and uh, to get that process started again. But it's basically incorporating that dried material back into the interior of the pile. Great, well I have another composting question here from Bob in Knife River who would like to know, composting eggshells, can you throw them in the garden? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, he's composting in the garden. Yeah, he's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. he's gonna compost for his eggshells, of course, contain um, calcium, calcium mm -hmm. but there's a lot of calcium in the soil. So one way or another, if you feel real good about adding calcium, uh, get the eggshells in there. Compost everything, but it's not a real significant uh, amount of soluble calcium for you. It's not going to hurt, though. No, yeah. no, it's no. it's great. That's I think some anything people get like hesitant that, because of anything like that you want to incorporate. But it's if you've got a calcium deficiency, you want to look mm -hmm. for a calcium source like calcium carbonate or something where you can really uh, correct that deficiency. Eggshells Quickly. aren't really going to do <laughs> it for you. Well, a lot of people seem to have questions about composting <laughs> and eggshells. I have one Already. from John in Duluth who also asked about eggshells, but also coffee grounds. Can you add them directly to your garden soil? Oh, I you do. certainly can. I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> and I'll, I'll even say I do top dress sometimes my soil, and I know it's not supposed to change the pH. And you know, I, I feel like I'm I'm doing good, and it, whether it's just a mental benefit that I'm using up my old coffee grounds, but mm -hmm. I'll even top dress some of my acid loving things thinking I'm doing a good job. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the acidic grounds, they are a little bit acidic, but that kind of gets neutralized. But they're organic material and just anything that's organic, you certainly can break down and, and work into your compost system. Use it Excellent. all for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Great. Perfect. Now, Deb, you wanted to speak to us about container gardens. Okay, because everyone's putting containers together now. I mean, it's been a long time coming, but everyone's got their materials, and so we have some slides. Everyone knows about the thriller, the filler, and the spiller. So in here, the thriller is the new proven winner. Saturn sunflower and then we have some zesty zinnias and then some trailing sweet potato vines and that's fine for thriller filler and spiller but the foliage is all similar size the flowers are all similar size so it's fine but you can do better and so then the next one we have is with King Tut as the thriller and then we have the uh, it's calliope geranium in this one as the filler and then the spiller is lobelia but then we've also added in some of the dusty miller for more foliage contrast so then you're getting contrast with the king tut in the size and the type of foliage and then the flower size is completely different between the calliope and the lobelia and that's a sun loving lobelia and then the next one we're even so when things kind of don't go as planned like this container has black and bloom salvia which is great as a deer resistant thing but it's also got um uh the coleus and that has great color in the foliage and people really love foliage color and then it has um, some of the sun patients and then trailing petunias now this trailing petunia i feel like is getting out of control already and it's only the 9th of june and if people think I should cut back my petunia. If you're thinking it, you should, because people always delay, oh no, oh no, no, cut it back. If you think it should be cut, cut it and give it a good fertilization too. And then the next one, we have 
a lot of different things going on here, different foliage colors, different sizes of flowers, and different sizes of foliage. So we have canna in the background, and um, a nice red flower, great structure to the canna. And then we have more sun patients with the bicolor foliage, and more um, sweet potato vine, and then some bacopa too. So you're getting all different flower size, all different, um, colors and foliage and everything. It's great to have filler, spiller, and thriller, but you should also consider the foliage colors and the flower sizes when you're putting together mm -hmm. combinations. That's great. Yeah, I really love the difference in the, the sizes of the flowers and the height. It's huge. Yeah. <laughs> it is huge. It's not just thriller, filler, and spiller. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing with us. Well, we can get back to some more questions now, and don't forget uh, <sighs> to make your call or your email to ask at WDSE.org right now, you still have time to get your questions in for our garden experts tonight. So let's head back in. Jim from Ashland has asked, he planted a garden, squash and pumpkin, 3,000 square feet. Crows walked from hill to hill and ate the seeds. What can he do? Well, right now he can replant. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing. Ouch. Here's a thought for him. Uh, why doesn't he, he can put some seed in the ground, but if he has a major bird problem, um, challenging to control, I would be seeding those in so you could get maybe, uh, yeah. just use your potting soil, uh, seed oh, some yeah. of them in, Start and about them. seven or eight, nine, ten days from now, you're gonna have a transplant, so you don't have to worry about the crows pulling the seed out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then I'd drop those transplants in very carefully because the roots yeah. are sensitive. But then he doesn't have to worry about the seeds being picked out individually. Right, so start it as a hill, yeah. so that mm -hmm. you just start one as every hill you just start in one container, so you're not, mm -hmm. yeah, pulling them apart. I think people do that a lot. Yeah, one, one seed, one cell in mm -hmm. a container, mm -hmm. or one mm -hmm. uh, small pot mm -hmm. if you've got that, and then lifting it out very carefully and setting it in the garden. Right. Put in a transplant as opposed to a seed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Well, we have a question about your crab apples you talked about oh, earlier. Okay. Uh, Tom from Duluth would like to know, how long do crab apple trees live? Ooh, that's oh. a good question. Um, they live a long time. They do, yeah. they do. And I would say, I mean, we've got them in the landscape that are 50, 60 years old, and they probably will live longer than that, but I think that uh, probably you're pushing it, when you get up around 70 or 80 years, that's going to be the max on a good site. Mm -hmm. But uh, And there are some trees that live longer than that, certainly. But uh, in the apple uh, family, I think if you've done that, you've done well. Protect from, from deer, get them off to a good start mm -hmm, initially, mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. uh, pretty soon they're very resilient and start with the hardy varieties. And keep cleaning up the suckers, keep cleaning it. I mean, they will live a long time, but you have to take really good care. I yeah. mean, not really good care, but good care of them. Yeah. Great, perfect. Dawn would like to know, when is the best time to water my garden? Morning, afternoon, night? Well, number the big, one is morning. Well, number one is morning. morning. The, the, the big thing is you don't want the foliage wet when temperatures cool down. Mm -hmm. So even if that means people are worried about uh, watering their garden at high noon because uh, something about uh, the water droplets burn the leaf tissue, and that's an urban myth right there. Uh, you wa high noon's better than late night when you could have that foliage moist. You're going to lose a little bit to evaporation. But other than that, you're not going to damage the plant. Try to stay it off, keep it off the foliage of a can and down near the base of the plant too. But morning's your preferred time. And I would say, and if it is getting hot, there is a benefit to a foliar application in the noon. Um, just because you can drop that basal leaf temperature down and then they're not as stressed and they don't go too well. When you start to, if you don't, can't get them in the morning and you have you're starting to get to wilt, you should get some water on them, however you can do that, because mm -hmm. they're, they're so much more prone to disease of all kinds. Mm -hmm. So are you telling me that when I was growing up and my mother said to get up early and water the plants, it wasn't imperative? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's most beneficial, but... Right. <laughs> Mothers are always right. <laughs> Whether or not it's imperative, they're always right. Right. <laughs> All right, moving on. We have a question from Jody. I have lilac bushes that have not been trimmed in over 15 years. They block the sidewalk to my front door, so I have to trim them this spring. What is your best advice for me? I'm a novice and clueless. What tool should I use? I like that combo, novice and, hey. and clueless. I know that feeling. <laughs> <Same>. uh, <laughs> you know, it, it'd be nice to know, wouldn't it, Deb, if, if uh, she had bloom up near the top, Vulgaris, if it was blooming, or, right? or mm -hmm, if it's mm -hmm. got a long woody stem. Right. 
sometimes um, you might have to take them right at ground level mm -hmm. and let them re-sprout and regrow. That takes a few years to get reestablished. But if they aren't blooming, if they're so large and never been pruned, and they're really not, or they're blooming at a very high mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. then you kind of have to start over. Well, and, and mm -hmm. I remember watching Great Gardening many years ago, yeah. and Bob said, <laughs> you take one-third of them down to the ground, if you want to clean it and flush it, yes. one-third every year, and then by the time that fourth year comes, you've got a brand new, established, beautiful lilac. Right. Now, if she's trying to just trim it just to get through the door, I don't know if that's it, but she could climb it that take that one take stem. that one third I mean down and that would flush new but I remember that and I tell people that all the time <laughs> <laughs> what what you're not going to get away with is just cutting them on the woody stem and expecting them to oh, re no. regrow yeah. and no, people think they're the going to prune it that way uh, you have to take those stems out so maybe if they're old and mature take one third right. at the ground yep, level down out. to yep. the ground yep that's Great. what not well, one third off the height. No, not I wasn't one third saying that. Height. He had said <laughs> one third to the ground. Gee, I, Perfect. I re recall that. You did it. I, years I ago. tell people it all the time. <laughs> I do. Oh, fantastic. Thank you both so much for answering all these questions for us. Great gardening will be back soon, so let's take another look at your sent in photos. Here's more of the local dirt. And now, more with the local dirt. Mickey McGilligan sent us a photo of some stunning salvia. Next, let's take a look at hardy cacti grown by Mike Heim of Hayward, Wisconsin. Mike also grew this evergreen ginger, which he says he's using in a shady region of his woodland garden. Now we're off to the gardens of Bob and Zabel Stadola, first iris and lupin grown from their front lawn. Next, a double white peony bush. great way to say welcome to our garden, we have flourishing lilies. And finally, amazing hollyhocks. Send us photos from your neighborhood, email us at greatgardening at wdse.org and it could show up on air or on our Instagram feed. Let's wrap things up with more questions. All right, Marty from Duluth asks, rabbits ate the lower branches of my arbor vitae. Will they grow back? <laughs> mm. Boy, I wish we could train those rabbits. Maybe yeah, to do some pruning. <laughs> do some, the do pruning some really, class. they need a pruning class. Yeah, I'm yeah. afraid that if, they're, if they've been taking them all the way down to the stem, that those stems will not grow back. You know, the tree will grow certainly above it, but uh, if they've just taken part of the green growth, then that will reflush for them. But if it's taking that green growth down to the stem, I'm afraid that they're they're done. Oh, Won't kill the plant though. Won't <laughs> no, kill no, the, no, the no. tree. Yeah, no. yeah. It'll great. Be Trish would like to know: Can you use Epsom salt as fertilizer for tomatoes and flowers? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, okay, we're going to disagree <laughs> here. I know <laughs> this. I, this. I know this. So um, I do use when I'm doing transplanting. When I transplant my tomatoes for a uh, really quick flush of green, and so there's no transplant shock, I do use a lot of Epsom salt in my transplanting of tomatoes. Mm -hmm. But Bob. But Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Epsom salts have their place. <laughs> and, Thanks, um, Bob. In the bathtub? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually in the growing community as well. Uh, they're not kind of the cure-all that people think, but they do provide a significant source of calcium. So I think that's important. We were talking about tomatoes and peppers and warm season crops, and we've seen some calcium deficiencies, particularly in quote-unquote garden soil mixes. So I think really some ep Epsom soil salts, if you're growing uh, peppers as an example, will help facilitate the growth of that plant and prevent some of this blossom and rotten tissue decay that we see from calcium deficiencies. So it definitely has a place, but don't overlook uh, a good organics, uh, a good mm -hmm. uh, fertilizer regimen and so forth because mm -hmm. they're not the cure-all, right. but they do supply a portion of the calcium that, that warm season crops could use. Great. There we go. <laughs> so we agree. <laughs> oh, okay. Kind of. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go back to crab apples, why don't we? Okay. So Teresa would like to know about crab apple tree site prep. She says, I have other apple trees to cross pollinate, but what do you recommend for whole size and what to put in it? Oh, that's, <laughs> that really is a good question. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it depends on what your native soil is. It makes a, a huge difference in how much you prepare and how much uh, long term, how, how much space you're giving it. The more you amend and make it easier on that tree to get started, the better it will be. But it does depend a lot on what your native soil structure is. That's a really good point. The worst thing you can do, if you have a heavy clay soil and if you just dig a hole, <sighs> and you backfill it with compost or something and plant it that the plant will never be able to acclimate. It'll come up and hit the barriers of that clay and will get these encircling sure. roots, which can be dangerous. So I would say that a shallow hole <laughs> rather than a real deep hole. And uh, if you want to see, use some organics, the, the mineral soil that you take out in a pile where you've dug that hole, mix it in there very thoroughly so that we don't really have any barrier, we don't have a barrier between an organic soil and the mineral soil, and then backfill with that mix with some of the or organic. But what we don't want to do is just dig deep a hole, a deep, deep hole, mm -hmm. fill it with a compost or garden soil, and then plant there. Instead, a mixture in a shallow rather in than a bowl. deep hole. It's really a bowl than a and you want to be very careful. She's going to look when she comes down. There's a graft union on a lot of these trees where you'll see a jog go down inside that container and look for the first flare root. That's the first root that comes out root, right yeah. below the surface. And that goes in place right yeah. below the surface. Don't plant Excellent. them too Do deep because right. we can have some problems that way. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Bob and Deb. And thank you all for tuning in to Great Gardening. If you want more, you can follow us on Instagram at Great Gardening WDSE, subscribe to us on YouTube at youtube.com slash Great Gardening, and like WDSE WRPT on Facebook. If you missed any part of the show, it will be posted on our YouTube channel and the PBS video app tomorrow. Thank you so much to you, Bob and Deb. You guys were fantastic. I learned so much from you tonight. Well, we sure enjoyed being on the program, and we want to thank, once again, thank all our viewers for being supportive of this program and all of public television. It's good stuff for yeah. us and for the community, for sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we will be back later this year. From all of us here, thank you so much, and enjoy the garden.